presentation of the Rio Grande Oil Company. Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast number 48 regarding a burglary at the Italian American Grocery Company on North Broadway. That's all. Rose and Cliff. Tonight, Calling All Cars is privileged to present as its guest artist. An actor who is known all over the world for his portrayal of racketeer roles in motion pictures. As well as being a famed actor, Al Hill is an authority on the New York underworld. His autobiography, Easy Picking, was a bestseller of 18 months ago. In tonight's dramatization, you will hear Al Hill in the part of Ed Curry. Tonight's program takes us into a police chemist's laboratory. Before the show starts, let's take a look behind the scenes and have a business talk with the chemist. There he is now, fooling with a lot of test tubes. What are you testing now, Mr. Chemist? Some evidence in a criminal case? Well, you might call it criminal. I'm testing some gasolines, and some of them would certainly murder any motor. They're not good enough to use in garbage trucks, let alone in police cars, ambulances, and fire engines. What do the tests say about Rio Grande cracked gasoline? Rio Grande cracked gasoline always tests high in all essential qualities. That's why many cities specify it year after year and use it in all their police cars, ambulances, and fire engines. What makes it so good? Well, it's that cracking process. It certainly gives Rio Grande a big advantage over uncracked gasoline. There's no sense in anyone buying uncracked gasoline when they can get Rio Grande cracked at the same price. <laughs> Tonight, Chief Davis has sent as his personal representative, Captain Bert Wallace, Chief of the Homicide Detail of the Los Angeles Police Department. Captain Wallace. Good evening, friends. Police work has changed more radically in the past five years than in any other similar period since the, since the kings of old empowered lan uh, lantern swinging watchmen to keep the peace in the towns and cities of antiquity. Science has come to our aid. Psychology has clarified the workings of the human mind and provided the police officer with a powerful weapon for penetrating the strange metal quirk lawbreakers often display. We have fingerprints classified in an elaborate system that in some cases records as many as five million separate sets of prints. Chemistry and physics provide us with a definite procedure to detect the lawbreaker and prosecute him, although he has the best alibi in the world. Such is the case in tonight's story. Without the aid of our police chemists, we could not have sent this band of burglars to the prison reward they so richly deserve. Who but a trained scientific criminologist would have uh, thought to search in a trouser cuff for the damning clue? Yet, such uh, apparently innocent and unimportant thing as the fuzz and dust in the trouser cuff is often the thin line between the victory of the forces of right or the powers of wrong. And now, on with the show. For several weeks last year, mysterious safe burglaries had occurred in rapid succession. No clues were left for the midnight cracksman. Yet in every job, the modus operandi was the same. A hole had been drilled in the upper left-hand corner of the safe, and the door ripped off with a crowbar. Police intensified their search for the criminals. But still, the safe continued to be cracked. One night at the restaurant, the next the market, the next the store. Then, one sunny December afternoon, a customer enters a small machine shop on Pico Boulevard. Good afternoon, and what can I do for you? I want you to make a gag for me. A gag? A gadget, a tool. Oh, yes, of course. Well, what was it you wanted? Well, here's a rough drawing. 
There wants to be a plate about three eight inch steel, shaped like this, with a slot in it, see? Oh, yes, yes. And then at the corner, they want a hole drilled and shredded and set screws put in so they can be turned by hand. Get me? Yes, sir. Make it plenty strong. Oh, you can be assured our work here is the very best. Sure, I know. When can I get it? Oh, you better give me a couple of days. Uh, say next Thursday? That's okay. But, uh, excuse me, but don't think I ever seen a tool just like this. Uh, would you mind telling me what you're going to use it for? Sure, I'd mind telling you. What's it to you? You got the order, haven't you? Well, oh, yes, of course. Uh, excuse me. That's okay, Pop. Matter of fact, there's no secret about it. Uh, you see, uh, I'm working on an invention, and uh, i got to have this gag for it. Oh, an invention. Sure. I can't tell you any more about it just now. Uh, you know how it is. Oh, oh, yes, of course. Okay, then. You got it straight? Yes, sir. How much will it be? Oh, say $3. All right. Well, I'll be back about 30. Go on. Three-eighth-inch plate, four set screws. In all my born days, I never heard of such a thing in my life. The next night, two men enter a small rooming house on North Broadway. Now, remember where we want it. Sure, I know. Where's the landlady's place? This door here. Hey, landlady. Open up. Oh, hold your hook. Hold your hook. Shall I get me that round? Hmm, Molly's bitty, ain't she? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, what's all the excitement raising the roof off of the house at this hour of the night? We want a room. A room, is it? You think you wanted the whole building, the racket you're making? What kind of a room do you want? Just a room. We want a flop for the night. Well, I've got a nice room on the street for 75 cents a night. Oh, no, 75 cents a night's too high. Yeah, and besides, I don't like the street. How about one on this side of the house? Well, you don't get the air only from a skylight. That's okay. We don't want no air. We want to sleep. Well, whatever you say, here's the key. It's number 15. And that'll be 50 cents in advance. In advance? Hey, we got a bag. And I don't care what you have. It's 50 cents in advance. How do I know you ain't got that bag stuffed with newspaper? All right, all right. Here you are. It's 50 cents a piece. A piece? Say, what do you think this is? A Biltmore? Well, take it or leave it. Okay, but it's robbery. 50 cents a piece, can you imagine? Is it you're wanting? Did a couple of guys just come in here? Sure they did. And they woke me out of a sound sleep and me just falling back to sleep when you come along. Ah, uh, that's tough. I'm with them, you see. What room are they in? Well, what do you want to know for? Well, I want to join them. What for? I'm going to spend the night with them. No, you ain't. Not in that room. Why not? Well, because there's only room in the bed for two. Well, that's okay with me. Well, it ain't okay with me. I can give you room across the hall from them. Oh, all right. That'll do. Very well. Just find the register under the name. Where? Right here? That's right. And no monkey business now, young man. This is a quiet place I run here. Sure, I know. And that'll be 50 cents. 50 cents? That's pretty steep, ain't Maybe it? Maybe it is for some, but them as ain't got 50 cents, I don't want me place, I don't. Well, look, uh, I only got 40 cents. That's enough. But I got a pack of cigarettes here. They're worth 15 cents. I'll give them to you, too. I want cash, and besides, I don't smoke. Well, if you don't smoke, you can give them to your old man, can't you? You ain't got enough money, young man, and my feet is getting cold standing out here into the hall. Oh, nuts. <laughs> A few moments later, the resourceful applicant for a room is back with the required 50 cents, obtained by some high-pressure panhandling, and receives the key to the room across the hall from his friend. A moment later, the occupants of room 15 are attracted by a tapping on the door. Hey, that's Ed. Let him in. Okay. Hello, boys. Hey, where you been? That held up. I was talking to a mug down on Spring Street about a journey skating trip. Yeah, who was it this time, Curry? That blonde hair slinger over the Denver dining room? Yeah, was it that fat fan dancer at Tony's? No, on the level, fellas. I was getting a load down on a slow job. 
Slow down or lay down? All right, all right. Well, let's cut out the beefing and get at that wall. Okay, we've been waiting for you, Curry. Where do we start? Well, as near as I can figure it, right here at the corner of the room. Let's see now. Uh, we're in the third room back from the street, aren't we? Right. Well, then we'll start right here in the corner. Okay, let's get at it. Hand me that stick. Curry, you better stuff something in the crack of the door to deaden the sound. How is it? Pretty soft. We ought to get through this wall in a couple of hours. How are you doing, Terry? It's a cakewalk. I'll have this hole drilled all the way through this box in another minute. Good. We haven't got all night. Listen, when I get that gag I'm having made, we'll bring boxes like that. All we'll have to do then is just turn the set screws and the combination will kiss the floor in no time. There we are. Turn off the juice. Now hand me that crowbar. Okay, boys. Now, let's lean on this thing. All right. Ready? Come on. Bend down on it. All right, now. Give us a little arm. One more heave. There we are. Hmm. I wonder where that grease ball keeps his sugar. <coughs> Open that big one. Ah, <coughs> uh, here it is. Hmm. Look at that. Over a grand easy. Not bad, huh? Oh, boy. Oh, well, let's make Kitty's eyes sparkle. Then forget that broad head and let's get out of here. Okay. Get that stuff packed stuff in the bag. Get that stuff packed in the bag, George, will you? And so does Doe in there, too. we got to take it on the lamb now, quick. <laughs> The next morning, while the officers at Lincoln Heights Police Station wearily take down the details of another clueless safe burglary, the proprietor of the machine shop on Pico Street, unable to allay his suspicion, brings the gadget he has been ordered to make to Captain Bert Mim of the burglary squad. So there it is, sir. I, I just can't figure out what he wanted it for, but it seems sort of suspicious to me. I suppose maybe I'm a little foolish. Shouldn't be taking up your time. On the contrary, I think your suspicions are correct. Send him Chilton and Castle. Now, what did this man look like? Well, he didn't look like no inventor. He looked like a sporting man to me. What do you mean by that? Oh, had his hair slicked back and had on a kind of flashy tie. Hmm. How tall was he? Oh, I'd say about medium height. Five foot ten? Yeah, about that. Yeah, how old? Ooh, round 30, I guess. What color hair? Black. What color eyes? Let's see. There was gray, I think. Hello, Cap. Oh, yes, boys. This gentleman just brought this in. Got any idea what it is? Sure. You turn the screws and you pull the combination out of the safe. Right. Now, the guy that ordered this thing will call for it this afternoon. I want you boys to stake out and find out where he goes. I think he may have something to do with these burglary jobs that have been bothering us. Want us to pick him up? Nah, just keep on his tail. Sooner or later, he'll hang himself. Detectives Chilton and Castle stake out the machine shop, and that afternoon, when the safe cracker calls for his tool, the two officers follow him to an apartment house on Hollywood Boulevard. That night, officers Leo Meisner and W.J. Grant from the Wilshire Division hail the suspect to the east side, where they see him deliver a package to two men, and then on out Valley Boulevard to Rosemead and back to Hollywood. The next day, Chilton and Castle stake out the apartment and arrest the man on suspicion of burglary as he's about to enter the, his car. At headquarters, they question him. What's your name? Edward Curry. Uh, where do you live? At the apartment house where you picked me up. How old are you? 32. Well, uh, what do you know about these safes that have been knocked off the last month? Nothing. What did you order that tool for? What tool? That tool you ordered from that machine shop on Pico. I don't know what you're talking about. Isn't it true that you ordered that tool to pull combinations out of safes? 
Say, what is this all about anyway? You guys are screwy. You got me wrong. Yeah, maybe we are. And maybe we haven't. Now, ah, look here, Curry. You'll do yourself a big favor if you come clean with us. You ain't got a thing on me. I ain't got a record. You can't make me even if you have mugged and printed me. Maybe so. But we do know everything you've been doing for the past four days. Mm, you ain't been peeking, Lieutenant. All right, Curry. Cut out the comedy. On Monday, you ordered an interesting little tool from a machine shop on Pico. Yesterday afternoon, you called at the machine shop accompanied by a blonde girl. What's her name? Well, uh, she's my wife. Yeah? She's also Kitty LaFleur. She's done time at Lincoln Heights for indecent exposure. You see, Curry, I used to work the vice squad. Now, isn't that lovely? You picked up your little toy at the machine shop and returned to your apartment. Later that evening, about 10 o'clock, you left the apartment and went to the Omaha Hotel on the east side. You talked to two men outside and handed them the package. Who are they? Well, if you know so much, why don't you tell me? Maybe I will. After you left them, you drove over to Valley Boulevard and out to Rosemead where you went into a house. You stayed there until 1 a.m. Then you returned to your apartment in Hollywood. Well, now, isn't that dandy? I bet you boys had a swell time playing detective and chasing me all over Los Angeles County. That sort of talk isn't going to get you any place. Why did you have that tool made? Well, what? an invention I'm working that on. That tool was made to pull combinations out of safe. Well, maybe you'd know. I wouldn't. Who were those two men you talked to in front of the Omaha Hotel? I haven't any idea. What did you do in that house in Rosemead? Well, I thought you knew all about me. Listen, Curly, why don't you admit your part in those burglaries and save us all a lot of time? Listen, boys, you ain't got a thing on me. Why should I admit anything that isn't so? You're barking up the wrong tree, and just to prove it to you, I'll take you to the room in the Omaha Hotel and let you ransack it as much as you like. I'm clean, I tell you. I ain't got nothing to hide. And when you get through snooping around, you're going to have to let me go. And then I'm going to force you to apologize for ever arresting me. Chilson and Castle escort Curry to the room in the Omaha Hotel. They search the plates carefully and find nothing. See? What'd I tell you? You're a wise guy, aren't you, sir? I don't need to be a wise guy. I'm clean. And like I said before, you ain't got a thing on me. Well, maybe you're right at that, Curry. Maybe we've made a mistake. Sure you have. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to send you back to your apartment in Hollywood with the driver. When you get out of the police car, you're free. Well, now you're talking. Hey, Eddie. Yes, sir. Take this man back to his apartment on Hollywood Boulevard. Ain't you coming along with us? No, careful. I can walk back to headquarters. We can drop you off. Well, we got to see a man down the street anyway. Well, uh, look, Lieutenant, you don't have to bother sending me all the way to Hollywood. I'll get home in a streetcar. We only want to be fair, Curry. We arrested you at your apartment, so we're compelled to return you back there. But, Lieutenant, I... I insist. You see that this man's taken to his apartment, Eddie. Okay, Lieutenant. Well, I guess that ends our little friendship, Curry. Well, so long. Uh, but just a minute, Chilton. Uh, there's something else I've got to ask you. Yeah, what's that? Uh, how about that apology? Oh, of course. I'd forgotten. I apologize, Curry. I'm awfully sorry we've inconvenienced you. Hmm, well, that's more like it. But, uh, so long, boys. And good luck with your sleuthing. Well, of all the big chumps, what's the idea of letting him go? It's simple. He's dead right. We haven't got a thing on him excepting suspicion. We can't prove a thing. But this way, we'll never see him again. He'll... Oh, no, he won't. He's more value to us free than in custody. He'll lead us right to the mob he's operating with, if he hasn't already. Say, what are you driving at? Guess this. This room is the headquarters for the outfit. His pals are going to come back here sooner or later. I told Eddie to take him to Hollywood so we'd have time to get some men on him. Now, while I stake out this place for the other two members of Curry's outfit, you hightail to a phone and have the captain detail a couple of men to Curry's apartment house with instructions to shadow him 24 hours a day. That way, we work both ends against the middle. Get it? Gilson's hunch is correct. For while Castle is phoning headquarters, two men enter the apartment. He arrests them on charges of suspicion of burglary. While these two suspects who give their names as Sidney Getzoff and George Stone are being booked, the full report of the Italian-American grocery store burglary arrived on Captain Min's desk. Having turned over the rooming house register to Adolph Carstensen for handwriting comparison, Captain Min interviews Getzoff in his office. Getzoff? There was a burglary committed in the Italian-American grocery on North Broadway the other night. What do you know about it? Hey, what's the big idea? Putting a bee on me and my friends like that, huh? What's the big idea? I asked you a question. 
What do you know about the Italian-American grocery store robber? Nothing. I should know when a Dago grocery loses a couple of yards of spaghetti. $1,600 to be exact. Well, you didn't find none of it on me, did you? No, we didn't. But your associations look suspicious. I want to get at the bottom of this matter. Yeah, you better look someplace else. Come in. Uh, do you want to report on this handwriting, Captain? Oh, yes, Carpenter. Come in. Uh, here's the register from the rooming house. Yeah. Here are the two bazillion cards. Now, notice the similarity of the loops on the G's on this signature and the way the T's are crossed on this one. Well, I'll take your word for that, Adolph. What I want to know is, are they similar? They're identical. The man who signed his name as Gettoff on the Batillion card signed the register at the rooming house as Robert Thompson. The man who signed his name as Stone on our books signed his name as Walter Miller on the register. Thanks, Adolph. Uh, anything else? If there is, I'll let you know. Yes, sir. Well, Gettoff, did you hear that? Yeah, I heard it. Were you in that rooming house on North Broadway the other night? No, I... Come on, gets off. We'll pass by that question. I know you were there, and so do you. All right, okay, I was there. So what? I went there with Stone for a little party, that was all. What kind of a party? What do you think? I think you're lying. You were in room 15, weren't you? I don't remember the number. Well, I can assure you it was 15. And a hole was dug in the wall of room 15, through which you entered the grocery store. You and your pals broke open the safe, took $1,600, and made your getaway back through the hole in the wall and out through the rooming house. Gee, is that what they did? That's what you did. Uh-huh, Captain. <laughs> you got the wrong guy. Me and my pal didn't have anything to do with it. You were in the room? Yeah, but we only went there for a little while. About 2 a.m., George and I and the girls left and went home. Somebody else must have come in the room after we left. There wasn't any hole in the wall when we were there. Ah, come on, Getzoff. You don't expect me to believe that. It's true. I don't know nothing about it. And you can't rubber hose me out of it, either. Nobody's going to rubber hose anything out of you, Getzoff. But we will send you up for burglary, whether you want to confess or not. Take this man back to his cell. All right, you come on. Hey, I want a mouthpiece. I want a mouthpiece, I tell you. You can't railroad an innocent man. We're not going to. We're sending a guilty man to the penitentiary. Hey, listen, I'll show you. You can't do this to me. I've got friends. I know people in this town. Take him out. Come on. Right, come listen, on. lay off. Yeah, I, 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 I. Uh, come in. Yeah, the landlady of that rooming house is out here. Bring her in. Can you come in, ma'am? That's him. That's him, Captain. Sure, and I know the ugly face of him anywhere in the world. That's who? who? Who are you talking about? That man that just walked out of here. He's one of them dirty devils that dug out my wall. Huh? Sure about that? Sure, I'm sure about it. I never forget anyone that comes into my place. Fine. You remember what the other ones looked like? Well, the other one that was in room 15 was a young fellow with a, a, just a stitch of a lad with yellow curly hair. I'm sure it's a sleep in his father's house he should be instead of out with the likes of them bums. Yeah, that'd be stone. Right. And what did the third fellow look like? Well, sure, he was about 30 years old with black hair and a uh, kind of a flashy dresser-like. Sounds like Curry. Sure. Look here, Chilton. You and Castle go out and pick up Curry. On your way out, ask Carsonson to compare Curry's handwriting with the register. Okay. And stop by Central. Tell Ray Pinker to go out to the Italian-American grocery store and look the place over for any physical evidence. Right. <laughs> Pinker, the police department chemist, investigates the torn wall and the burst safe. Tilson and Castle pick up Curry as he emerges from a beer parlor on Melrose Avenue, a girl on each arm. The detectives hustle him back to Captain Lynn's office. Hello, Curry. Say, hey, look here, Captain. What's the big idea? You and your bloodhounds are beginning to be a nuisance. Where were you last Monday night, Curry? Monday night? How should I know? I'd go lots of places. Well, I'll tell you where you were. You were in the rooming house next to the Italian-American grocery store. Oh, was I? Yes, you were. And you burglarized the safe in the Italian-American grocery store that night. Is that so? Yes, that's so. Now, do you want to talk? Well, maybe I was in the joint. I was delivering some whiskey that night for a boot like a friend of mine. Well, I took some stuff up there, that's all. Yes, and you beat the Italian-American grocery store out of $1,600 while you, you were there. You can't prove a thing. You signed a register in that rooming house under the name of Al Smith. Your handwriting on the blotter and the handwriting on the register are identical. I'll try to prove that in court. We will. Come in. You came back from that Italian American grocery company, Captain. Oh, yes, Baker. What did you find? Well, I got some samples of the fireplace and plaster, some wood fibers, slivers of steel, and shellac. Any fingerprints? No. Uh, just one of the suspects? Yeah. I was just questioning him. Uh, do you mind uh, sending him outside for a minute? No, of course not. Send us 
Ward and in for the prisoner. Take this man outside for a few minutes, Sergeant. Yes, sir. You'll save yourself a lot of grief if you let me go. You heard the Captain. Oh, all right. Now, what is it, Ray? What sort of a case have you got against those suspects? Mm, not very tight. I'm afraid they can beat the rap. Not when I'm through. Listen, I also found a button in that safe. Yes? Yeah. Now, what I want you to do is send that guy over to jail. Put him in dungarees and send me his clothes, as well as the clothes of the other two, and any clothes you found at that room at the Omaha Hotel. Well, what's the dope? I'd rather tell you tomorrow after I get the stuff. I may be crazy, but I think I can send those guys up for you. Captain Lynn does a seeker request, and the police chemist remains up all night, pouring over test tubes, adjusting retorts, peering in the microscope, working at his Bunsen burner. The next morning, he reports to Lynn. Well, Ray, I got your man. You have? How? It sounds silly, but they'll send themselves to the pen on their trouser cuffs. Well, what are you talking about? Well, I told you yesterday I got specimens of fire clay and plaster and wood fiber, steel and shellac from the scene of the crime. Yeah. The fire clay and plaster were obtained from the broken wall. The wood fiber came from uh, some two-before studs that were cut through. The steel came from the safe and the shellac from the wall shelves in the store. So, so I investigated the trouser cuffs of the three suspects. I found in them samples of fire clay, wood fiber, steel, plaster, and shellac. You did? Yes, sir. Yeah, but anybody might pick up stuff like that in their trouser cuffs. A carpenter or a machinist, for example. Can you prove it in front of a jury? Sure. I found all of those specimens in the trouser cuffs, and chemical analysis shows them to be the same as the specimens that procured at the scene of the crime. Now, any single specimen on the suspect wouldn't be enough to convict. But the combination of specimens is sure to convince any jury. And furthermore, this will cinch it. What? This broken button. Yes? I found it inside the safe. You did? Yeah. See this leather jacket? Yes. Yeah. This is Getzoff's jacket. Now look at the concentric lines on this broken button from the safe, and notice that the third button on this jacket is broken. Now watch. They fit? Yeah. And the concentric lines match? Right. And any jury that doesn't send those boys to the pen is asleep on its feet. The jury was not asleep on its feet. Get soft. Stone and Curry went on trial. Get soft stoutly maintained testimony that Stone, the kid, was not present at the time of the crime, resulting in his acquittal. But Get soft's broken button convicted him, and Edward Curry's record, provided by a half a dozen eastern cities, showing a total of 68 arrests for crimes ranging from petty theft to suspicion of murder, plus Ray Pinker's expert testimony convicted him, and the two men were sentenced to San Quentin Penitentiary for from one to 15 years on a verdict of second-degree burglary. Thank you, Captain Wallace. And now tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to call for a curtain speech from a member of our cast who is really an expert on criminology, one who has been associated with most of the big-shot racketeers throughout the United States and knows how to talk their language. In a moment, I shall introduce Al Hill, who played the part of Ed Curry, leader of a safe-cracking gang in tonight's broadcast. But first, let me ask the boys and the girls who are listening if they have yet joined the junior police department. The police want your help to fight crime, to prevent accidents. And if you enroll, you get a genuine metal police badge. Just get father or mother to ask at any service station selling Rio Grande cracked gasoline for a junior police department enrollment card. There is nothing to buy, and you get your police badge absolutely free. And now, as I promised, I introduce to you our guest artist, a man who has appeared in over 100 movies for the various studios, and the author of a bestseller, Easy Picking a book dealing with racketeering. Al Hill. Well, I was a pretty bad guy tonight. <laughs> but I am pleased to compliment the producers of calling all cars for the stark realism they put into their programs. 
Tonight's show, for instance, depicted three underworld characters as they really are. And believe me, I know. Many years ago, when I came in contact with such characters, there were no such things as police radio patrol cars. And now that the police have cars equipped with radio and power with Rio Grande crack gasoline, I am positively certain that the crook hasn't a chance. <laughs> well, just today I learned the lesson when I was hurrying to the studio. Matter of fact, I was hitting 50 on the side road. I thought I was getting away with it. But just as nice as you please, a police car breezed up alongside of me. And now, I have a lovely little souvenir in my vest pocket. Yes, sir. <laughs> Tonight, after I came here, I learned that the police car was powered with Rio Grande cracked gasoline. So from now on, I'll be using Rio Grande, too. That police car performance sold me today. <laughs> There's no two ways about it, folks. Anyone who has an ounce of sense must know that crime don't pay. Why, that was illustrated to me this very morning by watching a little mouse getting his head caught in a trap of sealant some cheese. You just can't get away with it. That is all. Al Hill. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hill. <laughs> Broadcast 48 regarding a burglary. Suspects in this case now in custody. That's all. Rules and clues.